I'm Walter Bosley, author of Secret Missions, The Hidden Legacy of Old California. Available print-on-demand only at lulu.com. Chapter 7. The Maid of Orleans Probably in 1412 A.D., Joan of Arc was born in a French village to a local official who farmed 50 acres of land in an area of France where loyalists to the crown, as young Joan's family was, were outnumbered. When she was 12 years old, according to Joan's own testimony, she experienced a vision in the family garden. Three figures appeared to her, St. Michael, St. Margaret, and St. Catherine of Alexandria. So beautiful that they made her cry upon their departure, Joan said the saints told her to expel the English from France. A few years later, Joan went to the garrison commander at Vacalur, announced that she was the only hope for the kingdom, and made a prediction of military victory at Orléans. With borrowed armor and dressed as a boy, jo Joan went to Orléans, and a change in tactics led to victory, Joan in the middle of it all, bearing the standard. From that point, Joan was at the front of one French victory after another, and her reputation preceded her. Joan and her family were granted nobility by Charles VII. Joan's troubles began during a truce with the English when she led a force to oppose the combined English and Burgundian siege against Compagne. There, on the 23rd of May, 1430, Joan was captured by a Burgundian archer and imprisoned in a tower from which she attempted several escapes. She was subsequently transferred to English custody in Rouen. She had to wear military clothing to protect herself from rape by the guards. Angered by the treatment of Joan by her captors, Charles VII condemned the Burgundians and threatened vengeance on the English and their women. Attempts to rescue Joan were successfully resisted, and she remained in captivity. It is universally concluded that the trial of Joan of Arc was motivated by politics. Made up of English and Burgundian clerics, the tribunal proceeded on a predetermined course and operated most illegally. It was later criticized by the chief inquisitor on several points, such as improper jurisdiction, poor standard of evidence, and that it was financed by the English government. Essentially, Joan was doomed from the start. Despite no incriminating evidence against her and denial of a lawyer in her defense, the English even threatened to kill the French vice inquisitor if he did not cooperate. The English secular authority repeatedly bullied ecclesiastic officials and the church was undermined at every turn. The only hope Joan had was her uncanny ability to outmaneuver her interrogators, which she did often to the astonishment of witnesses. Ultimately, Joan was forced to sign a confession she did not understand and was condemned for heresy, a charge trumped up on her wearing of the protective male clothing. And she was burned at the stake on the 30th day of May, 1431 A.D. That is the story that those familiar with Joan of Arc will recognize, and it indeed happened that way. But what I didn't know until I started researching Leeds was what the focus of the trial seemed to really be all about. If you read the transcripts of the trial of Joan of Arc, and they are available, you may be as astonished as I was. Certainly Joan was hated by the English because the French army humiliated them repeatedly whenever she was present, and the heresy charge was a complete fraud, but it is clear they were after something else. During the trial, the inquisitors pursued the issue of what happened to Joan's sword, and they were not pleased with her answer. It could be described as an obsession. The sword of Joan of Arc has an interesting story to it. According to Joan herself, she was directed to the sword by none other than St. Catherine of Alexandria, whom Empire of the Wheel readers will know as Hecate. After obtaining the sword in question, Joan carried it into a battle in victory after victory. But just weeks before she was captured, Joan stopped carrying the special sword. The inquisitors at her trial questioned her intensely on the sword and where it was presently located. Joan did not know, for she had given it to her brothers for safekeeping. According to Joan, she had been directed to the church of St. Catherine de Firbois by St. Catherine herself. 
Joan was told by the saint, or Hecate, that the sword could be found buried behind the altar, and indeed it was. Joan was given two decorative scabbards for this special sword, but she chose to carry it in leather. It was apparently a true battle sword, not decorative, and it had been left at the Firbois Church as an offering in thanks for victory by its previous owner. When Joan obtained it, the blade was rusted, but with very little effort it was cleaned and polished brightly. Though Joan said she preferred carrying her standard into battle, during her victorious episodes she had this sword on her person, and it seemed she was invincible with it. During the trial, the Inquisitors repeatedly asked questions about the Firbois sword, as they referred to it. They wanted to know if she had placed it on altars. They wanted to know if she had the sword blessed. They asked about every sword she carried, wanting to know if it had been the Firbois sword. But she deftly identified her other swords at each turn. They ultimately just wanted to know the whereabouts of the one sword. Joan told them that she had given it to her brothers with all her other belongings and did not know where it was at present. She refused to answer any more questions about it. So what was so special about this particular sword? In spite of the tribunal's clearly expressed interest in the Firbois sword, the remainder of the transcript does not go into the details of it, and history generally does not focus on it either. Is this because the English chose to subsequently deter any further public knowledge of their interest in the sword? They had Joan herself. Her captivity surely affected French morale. With Joan on trial and in their hands, the English could save face and gloat. What did it matter where her sword was? Why might the English have been so determined to get the sword? A closer look at Joan of Arc's Firbois sword might reveal the answer, and for this we go to the fascinating research done by Lance Bernard, an avid sword collector who wanted a replica of Joan's Firbois sword, but could not find one offered anywhere, in spite of the popularity of such collectibles in our times. So he decided to have one made, and dug into the sword's history to obtain an exact description. It was the pursuit of this description that led Bernard to a most revealing story. Joan of Arc's Firbois sword, which she claimed to have been led to by St. Catherine or Hecate, was described only in her testimony at the trial. Bernard was faced with no knowledge of the sword's length, weight, blade shape, or its hilt design. Joan merely said that the sword was rusty when she found it, and it had five crosses upon it. Bernard's research revealed that even the many witnesses who had seen the blade only repeated the the description offered by Joan at the trial. The five crosses she described could have been on the blade or the hilt. Bernard wasn't able to find evidence as to which. He does propose that the cross images could have been an inlay on the blade, which had become common in Joe's time, likely as a signature of the individual blacksmith. In fact, Bernard points out, we may not even be sure it was crosses on the sword if they were on the blade. That might have been how Joan interpreted what was on the sword. How was he ever going to find an accurate description? Was the clue in its deeper history? Bernard discovered that the history of the sword and Firbois may have revealed who its previous owner had been. One clue was that the people and priests of Tours had given Joan two scabbards. The priest had given her a scabbard made of crimson velvet, and the people offered theirs of gold cloth. Because the sword was of apparent battle quality, Joan graciously accepted the scabbards, yet carried the sword in a leather scabbard on the field. Why would the people of the city of Tours be so interested in her special sword? Bernard explored the pedigree further and discovered something quite revealing. He found the hammer. Born in the late 7th century and rising to power in the 8th, Charles Martel was a mil military leader and statesman who ruled the Frankish kingdom in the early Middle Ages. As the power behind his father's throne, Charles Martel, a.k.a. the Hammer, embarked on military campaigns that centralized government in Francia and rule over Gaul. Martel's skills as administrator and soldier At the forefront, put him at the forefront of the founding leaders of Europe's medieval period, and the development of European knighthood and feudalism are credited to him. 
Martel is also famous for having defeated, against overwhelming odds, the Saracens at the Battle of Tours, halting the advance of Islam into Western Europe. It is to Tours Lance Bernard's quest for the sword led, and where we shall follow. In October of 732 AD, in the countryside between Poitiers and Tours, near the border of Aquitaine, Frankish and Burgundian forces led by Charles Martel found themselves outnumbered by the Muslim army of the Umayyad Caliphate commanded by Abdul al-Ghafiqi. Without the benefit of a cavalry, Martel led his army of seasoned infantry and inexperienced militia screened by trees on the high ground into a surprise attack on the larger Muslim force, then considered the finest military in the world. His choice of the high ground gave his somewhat shaky forces an advantage over the enemy's cavalry that would surely have decimated the Europeans on an open field of battle. The Muslim forces were forced to fight an uphill battle. In spite of the inexperienced militia, Charles's well-seasoned infantry surprised al Ghafiqi's soldiers with their expertise in combat. al Ghafiqi's concern for the encroachment of winter that his army was not prepared for led to his perhaps hasty decision to not wait for the Frankish army to advance, but to send repeated cavalry assaults to the high ground against them. But Martel and the Franks stood their ground against the legendary Umayyad cavalry. When the Muslims attempted to target Martel himself, the Hammer's men surrounded their leader and shielded him. It was with a trick that Martel ultimately defeated the army of the Caliphate. The Mozarabic Chronicle of 754, considered the most detailed source of the Battle of Tours, described it this way, and I quote, And in the shock of battle the men of the north seemed like a sea that cannot be moved. Firmly they stood, one close to another, forming as it were a bulwark of ice, and with great blows upon their swords they hewed down the Arabs. Drawn up in a band around their chief, the people of the Austrasians carried all before them. Their tireless hands drove their swords down to the breasts." End quote. While the Muslim forces were focused on Martel and his army at the high ground amid the trees, Martel sent scouts into the Arab camp to release slaves, steal booty captured from previous battles, and generally cause chaos. This alarmed al Ghafiqi's forces so effectively that much of the cavalry abandoned the battle to return to camp, which, in turn, led much of the Muslim army to think a retreat had been ordered, and they followed suit. Astonished by this turn of events, al Ghafiqi entered the heart of the fray, trying to regroup his army. He was surrounded by the Franks and killed, which sent whatever remaining Muslim forces scurrying back to their camp to join the others. Martel and his army maintained their position through the night and into the next morning, until scouts confirmed that the mighty Muslim forces of the Umayyad Caliphate the so-called finest fighting force in the world, had fled in the night, not to return, leaving tents and other debris behind in their haste. The Frankish army had won the day and saved Western Europe from Muslim tyranny. And Charles Martel had led that victory armed with the sword of Firbois. What Lance Bernard found in his research was quite a fascinating tale that resonates with the thesis of this book. Bernard's research explored the possibility that the sword had simply been one of many left as a votive offering in the church, its owner before Joan likely being a crusader of no special significance. However, the evidence did not support that. It kept coming back to Charles Martel. So Bernard dug deeper and discovered some interesting qualities of swords fashioned from the iron of meteorites. It led him to speculate the following scenario. Before the Battle of Tours commenced, Charles Martel realized the forecast did not look good for his army of mostly ill-equipped and unseasoned militia. The night before the battle that would take place, as his scouts reported on the Muslim forces and Tours burned from enemy ransacking, Martel wondered if God would send a sign. That very night, a bright light streaked across the sky and an object crashed to the earth. Martel rode out to find a group of his men surrounding a glowing rock, a meteorite, which the hammer ordered taken back to camp. Martel instructed his blacksmith to work through the night, fashioning a beautiful sword. With this shining new weapon, Martel addressed his men, telling them that the sword had been sent by God and would lead them into victory. Their world depended on it. 
Martel's army found new, renewed strength and went into the battle the next morning, standing firmly beside their leader, confident of victory. Following the battle, Charles Martel and his army returned to the ravaged city of Tours, finding the small village of Firbois unscathed. There in the church, Martel offered the magnificent sword back to God and buried it behind the altar, where it would remain until needed again and put into the hands of the Maid of Orleans, Joan of Arc, by St. Catherine or Hecate, the namesake patron of the Church of Firbois. Could it have happened this way? Bernard presents a compelling speculation, and he backs it up with an interesting analysis involving the forging of swords from meteorite iron. But before we go there, and we will because it is integral to an argument in this book, let's continue the speculative thread of ownership of this mysterious sword of Joan of Arc because the implications may astonish you. The idea that the sword of Firbois carried by Joan of Arc, and very possibly carried by Charles Martel at the Battle of Tours, was forged from a meteorite puts an intriguing suggestion into our laps. That this same sword was bestowed upon Joan by a female supernatural entity who was also the patron namesake of the church where it was found, possibly put there by Martel in thanks to a supernatural entity for answering his call with said sword, further forces us to deal with the implication that this very special sword may have indeed been forged from a meteorite. And what is a meteorite but a rock or stone from the heavens or gods? This very special sword, forged or drawn, so to speak, from the meteorite or stone, is given to a national hero in time of her country's need by a female entity, as it was by its previous national hero, who used it in another time of need. Where else have we heard this? Secret Missions, The Hidden Legacy of Old California is available print-on-demand only at lulu.com.